Hello, I'm Victor Strandberg, and in this session, we're going to take up at last T.S. Eliot's most celebrated achievement in poetry, The Wasteland, the central poem in English of the 20th century. The title, The Wasteland, evidently came about when T.S. Eliot read Jesse Weston's book, From Ritual to Romance, from which, in the first note to the wasteland, as I said in our last session, Eliot derived the title, the plan, and a good deal of the incidental symbolism in this poem. Originally, the title was from a novel of Dickens, He Do the Police in Different Voices. We'll find out as we get into the poem that that concept remains. The poem is a study of many voices uh, joined together uh, to make up the wasteland. And a crucial part of understanding this poem is to disentangle those voices as they come up one after the other. That's what we shall do as we go into part one. But first of all, we have the title page, The Wasteland, with a date 1922, and with a fragment of literature from ancient Roman times. Uh, this excerpt is from the Satyricon of Petronius. Satyricon spelled S-A-T-Y-R-I-C-O-N. And the satyr uh, was, of course, a figure representing the decadence of the Roman Empire under the Emperor Nero and other such emperors. The um, excerpt is written in Latin and Greek, and a rough translation would read as follows, underneath the title of the whole poem, The Wasteland. Now I myself, with my own eyes, saw the Sibyl of Kumai hanging in a jar. Uh, we could pause for a moment and explain that the Sibyl of Kumai, um, a voice of wisdom in this excerpt, asked for immortality. The gods granted immortality, but she forgot to ask for eternal youth. And so as she aged through the centuries, she got smaller, as old people tend to do. And now she is so small that she can fit inside a jar. So the excerpt shows some young men coming to get advice from this voice of wisdom, the Sibyl of Kumai. When I myself saw the Sibyl of Kumai hanging in a jar, those young men asked her, and that's where we go into Greek, what do you want? And she answered, I want to die. This excerpt brings up then the subject of mortality or death, something to be desired uh, so far as the Sibyl of Cumai goes, and something I also think proves desirable as an alternative to the wasteland in part four of this poem, Death by Water, as we'll see when we get to that. But for now, we could say that this issue of mortality is one of the two great issues that dominates this poem, how to cope with one's mortality, specifically without a myth of rebirth. This um, theme, how to cope with mortality, without a myth of rebirth, evokes one of the two great dimensions of all major religious traditions, metaphysics, and the other is ethics. Now, metaphysics is a word that means more than physical. Uh, in short, it refers to the supernatural in the great religious traditions. And it is through the supernatural that these traditional religions offer a myth of rebirth. In the Christian faith, of course, 
It is through the resurrection of Jesus, that myth of rebirth, that all believers can share in the resurrection of Jesus after this mortal life is over. When I use the phrase a myth of rebirth, I'm not referring to the truth or falseness of this myth. Uh, it may be true and correlate with reality, or it may be simply a figment of imagination. Uh, that's not the issue here. The issue is one of belief, that a myth is a belief held by an individual, or it may be shared by the entire society, that is so fundamental and important to one's life that on it depends the meaning of one's life, or indeed the meaning of the existence of that society. And there is no myth more important to any society, or we might say individual, than some form of a myth of rebirth to satisfy this metaphysical question of attaining a satisfactory relationship to eternity. Naturalistically, one's relationship to eternity is that death is the permanent extinction of the self. A myth of rebirth offers a better alternative. The other great dimension of all religious traditions is ethics, the conduct of life here in this world. In the wasteland, the first and fourth sections of the poem, the burial of the dead, section one, and section four, death by water, take up the metaphysical issue of how to cope with the burial of the dead in a time without a myth of rebirth. And the other dimension, ethics, the conduct of life here and now, is the subject of parts two, three, and five. These two dimensions, metaphysics and ethics, interweave each section of the poem, but the main thrust of sections one and four would be the issue of how to cope with the burial of the dead, and the main thrust of parts two, three, and five, the game of chess, the fire sermon, and what the thunder said, those sections mainly deal with trying to attain a higher level of ethical conduct and thereby alleviating the sufferings of the wasteland. Can that happen in a time without belief? Before we leave the title page, we should note that the poem is dedicated to Ezra Pound, Il Miglior Fabro, that is the greater poet, the greater artist. There is a touch of irony in that dedication. Eliot had every reason to be grateful to Ezra Pound for helping him through those formative years of his career as a poet, helping him to get published, uh, publishing Proofrock in 1915, and uh, helping him above all editing this poem cutting out about half the poem and making it a much incomparably better poem through eliminating about half of it as Ezra Pound did with his ruthless scissors. Nonetheless, Ezra Pound was not Emilio Fabro. Both Pound and Eliot knew that this poem would displace Ezra Pound as the major modern poet of the time and Eliot himself would ascend that throne. In fact, um, Pound sent a note to Eliot when The Wasteland was published saying, complimenti, you bitch, I am racked by the seven jealousies. Now, as we get to the poem proper, the first thing I want to do is to say a few words about the title of section one, The Burial of the Dead. That title comes from the Anglican Prayer Book. If you go to a funeral in an Anglican church or an Episcopal church, 
uh, there is an order for the burial of the dead in the Anglican prayer book that the priest will follow. And the very first words that are uttered in the funeral service in an Episcopal or Anglican church read as follows, the priest speaking, I am the resurrection and the life, saith the Lord. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And so whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. There's your myth of rebirth, the way in which Christians confront the issue of the burial of the dead. Now in the wasteland, of course, that belief is not credible. And so we have to proceed in this poem with T.S. Eliot's way of handling that issue, that problem. The opening lines of the wasteland are among the most famous in English poetry. They appear to be a reply to Geoffrey Chaucer in Canterbury Tales, who famously began that magnificent work with a welcome to the springtime. On that April with her shoulder solta, the drought of March hath pierced to the rota, which is to say, when April, with its sweet showers, has pierced the drought of March. Uh, when uh, the flowers spring up in the springtime, when the birds are making melody, then people long to go on pilgrimages, enjoying a beautiful ride through the countryside in the springtime. T.S. Eliot famously rebuts that mood. Instead, he says, April is the cruelest month. Now, we might ask why April is cruel. I think we'd have to note that in his personal life, April was thought to be the month when T.S. Eliot's soulmate, John Verdenal, was thought to have drowned in the Dardanelles campaign. It turned out later that it could have happened perhaps on the 1st or 2nd of May, but it also could have happened in April and was thought to have happened in April. The larger reason why April is the cruelest month uh, would obviously be because it is a time of the upsurge of desire of sexuality in all living things, including humankind. So April is the cruelest month then, breeding lilacs in the dead land, mixing memory and desire. Those are two forms of cruelty because in Eliot's experience, memory is generally a memory of a better life in the past. It is a memory of loss, such as the loss of Jean Verdinal, or the loss of childhood and its innocence, uh, pitted against the naturalistic bleakness of adult life. Memory and desire, desire of course that cannot be requited, uh, a great hunger, I think, dominates this poem as far as that theme is concerned. There is one other reason why April is the cruelest month. For centuries in the past, when people died in northern climates, they could not be buried during the winter time. The ground froze so hard that if you tried to dig a hole and say swing a pick, the pick would bounce back at you as though you were trying to chop into cast iron. So the dead would have to be stacked up during the winter, and uh, then they might be buried when the ground thaws in the springtime, perhaps in this month of April. Certainly that would be a reason why April is the cruelest month, and it would tie in with the theme, the burial of the dead. Now as we proceed in this opening passage of the wasteland, uh, we've touched on April stirring memory and desire, forms of hunger that cannot be appeased. And therefore, as 
memory and desire stir dull roots with spring rain. We look back with some nostalgia on the winter, which kept us warm, covering earth in forgetful snow, leaving memory and particularly desire alone. Feeding a little life with dried tubers, uh, that is what winter did for us, to our advantage. Now those cruel, unanswerable yearnings are awakened once again with the turn of the year, the month of April. Now at this point, the opening voice in the wasteland ceases. Uh, we remember that the original title, He Do the Police, in different voices, suggests that this poem initially was an exercise in style, in multiple voices jumbled together. And in order to understand the poem, we have to disentangle the voices. It takes perhaps a trained ear or an educated eye uh, to do this with confidence, but I think it can be done plausibly. And here, I think, is where the next voice cuts into the poem. We could call that first initial voice the voice of a philosophical, meditating uh, individual, an observer of the wasteland. And that voice, of course, will tr come in and out of the poem throughout the rest of the way. But at this point, the voice that intrudes is that of a woman, and scholars have identified her as a Princess Marie of Austria, and she is here experiencing memory and desire, the memory of the time before the war, when being a princess meant something, and uh, she's looking back then at a happier time in the past. During World War I, of course, the great dynasties of Europe collapsed. For that matter, the Ottoman Empire collapsed, producing chaos that is still going to, in our own time as the remnants of the Ottoman Empire fall into civil war in places like Egypt and Syria or go to war with each other. The voice of Princess Marie then, remembering with desire, a happier time in the past. Summer surprised us, she says, coming over the Starnberger See. The Starnberger See is a beautiful lake near Munich in Germany. Uh, the, you could see swans swimming near the shore. And across the far end of the lake, you could see the Alps Mountains, a gorgeous spectacle. Summer surprised us coming over the Starnberger See with a shower of rain. We stopped in the colonnade and went on into the sunlight into the Hof Garden and drank coffee and talked for an hour. Now this is a moment of human communion. And in the isolation that affects Eliot's poetry, uh, isolation that we saw in Prufrock or Portrait of a Lady, and other poems we could point to. Uh, this is a moment that transcends that feeling of loneliness, and therefore it is a happier memory in the past. At this point, a voice breaks in in a different language, someone speaking German. Bin gar keine Russen, stamm aus Litauen, ebt Deutsch. I am not Russian. I am from Lithuania. I am a genuine German. This jumble of voices from different languages in the poem may be a reflection on the Tower of Babel story in the book of Genesis, in the Bible, uh, wherein originally all people spoke the same language. Then when they built the Tower of Babel, God was displeased and arranged uh, for a breakup of that common language so that people could no longer have that common effort of building the tower. 
the theme of loneliness, of course, is accentuated by this use of foreign languages breaking in, French, German, Italian, even ancient Sanskrit, before the poem is over. People literally cannot understand each other. There's one other element in this use of foreign languages. T.S. Eliot wrote much of the wasteland when he was a patient at a sanitarium in Switzerland, trying to overcome his nervous breakdown. Uh, this was in the city of Lausanne on Lake Geneva. And there, T.S. Eliot would have heard other patients from different parts of Europe speaking different languages. It is likely that some fragments from what he overheard turn up in this poem. Now, if we ignore that interruption in the German language, we can carry on with Princess Marie coming up with another memory uh, of a beautiful time in her childhood in this case. And here we have to use one of those terms that we might call jargon, professional jargon, but I think this one we do have to contend with. The use of the word epiphany. James Joyce made it a secular term in his writing, but it goes back actually to sacred writs. When the three wise men came across the desert, led by the steadfast star in the sky to the Christ child, and when they reached the Christ child, they had an epiphany, which is literally uh, the experience of visitation with a god. The god in this case would be the Christ child. And uh, so we have the feast of the epiphany in the Christian calendar, marking that occasion of the three wise men coming to the Christ child. Uh, James Joyce, as I say, secularized it so that an epiphany is any transcendent experience, elevating one above ordinary life and its dreariness into a moment of ecstasy. Now that too is part of the memory and desire located in the past, a memory of a beautiful time when Princess Marie was a princess before the fall of these great dynasties, the, the Romanovs in Russia, uh, the uh, Hohenzollerns in Prussia, uh, the Habsburgs in Austria, etc. And so we proceed then with that epiphany of Princess Marie. When we were children staying at the Archduke's, my cousins, he took me out on a sled and I was frightened he said, Marie, Marie, hold on tight, and down we went, ecstatically. Now, after the war, after the collapse of the empires, there is no princess or archduke uh, any longer. Now, instead, we have this meaningless routine. You might say it's one of those motifs of the wheel turning in the individual life, a meaningless circuit of experience. In the mountains, there you feel free, she says. I read much of the night. She's an insomniac, like other Eliot characters, and goes south in the winter. We end that intrusion into the original voice, that philosophical, meditative, melancholy voice that started the poem. And we go back to that voice at this point with a question that has a religious reference. What are the roots that clutch? What branches grow out of this stony rubbish? Now, in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, as Christians would call it, the greatest of the Hebrew prophets, the prophet Isaiah, predicted the coming of the Messiah as a root out of dry ground. Christians, of course, think Jesus is the Messiah, is that root out of dry ground. The point of that image in Isaiah and in the life of Jesus is that a root does not grow out of dry ground. It requires supernatural intervention. 
and spiritually the ground has never been drier in T.S. Eliot's estimation than here in the modern wasteland. So the question then can be put without any hope of a satisfactory answer. Where is this root out of dry ground? What are the roots that clutch? What branches grow out of this stony rubbish? Uh, Jesus is also called a branch in the New Testament. So probably that's an additional reference, what branches grow out of this stony rubbish. The next phrase, son of man, is a decidedly biblical formulation. It's used in both the Hebrew Bible and the Christian Bible. Uh, it's often used to refer to Jesus, who is both described as the son of man and the son of God. There is, of course, no God in the wasteland, so there cannot be a son of God, but we can still use the phrase son of man. Son of man, in reply to that question, what are the roots that clutch? What branches grow out of this stony rubbish? Son of man, you cannot know or guess, for you know only a heap of broken images where the sun beats and the dead tree gives no shelter, the cricket no relief, the dry stone no sound of water. There's only the wasteland in short this naturalistic environment. Uh, there is shadow under this red rock, the poet goes on to say, or that original and dominant voice actually in the wasteland goes on to say, come in under the shadow of this red rock and I will show you something different from either your shadow at morning striding behind you well, that's not so bad. It's more sinister, however. Or your shadow at evening rising to meet you. This, after all, is a section on the burial of the dead. I will show you fear in a handful of dust. Well, we are told in Genesis that God scooped up a handful of dust, puffed on it, and made mankind. With, according to Genesis, some spiritual dimension in his existence. That spiritual dimension is very much in question, leaving fear in that handful of dust in its place. The original philosophical voice that we've heard twice now stops at this point, and a new voice breaks in, in the German language. In fact, this is music. Uh, the, one of the greatest composers of all time, Richard Wagner, is cited here. And Eliot is citing his great opera of erotic love, Tristan and Isolde. We know from Eliot's biography, from his letters, that he and his friend Jean Vernal attended this particular opera, Tristan and Isolde, and for T.S. Eliot, it was virtually a mystic experience, transported him to some transcendent realm above ordinary experience. So it shows up here in the poem. Uh, but what's important about that opera is that the two lovers experience memory and particularly desire, which is never satisfied. So the two lovers here are portrayed as yearning to each other but not uh, being able to arrange an encounter. Uh, the medieval story of Tristan and Isolde is that Tristan was a young man living in Britain. Isolde was living in Ireland. Their two tribes were at war, but sort of like Romeo and Juliet, these two fell in love with each other and we see them yearning across the Irish Sea to be with each other. So as we look at these lines then from Wagner, uh, let me cite what Wagner wrote, Frisch wird der Find, der Heimat zu, mein irisch Kind, vo feilest du. Uh, 
fresh blows the wind toward home. My Irish sweetheart, where are you? This fragment from Eliot's love opera is followed by another episode of memory and desire. This could be something close to Eliot's own life. I rather suspect it is. It is the Hyacinth Girl episode. And we begin with the girl speaking about a better time in the past. You gave me hyacinths a year ago. They called me the hyacinth girl. And the man she is addressing replies, yes, when we came back late from the hyacinth garden, your arms full and your hair wet, I could not speak. My eyes failed. I was neither living nor dead, looking into the heart of light, the silence. This was almost a mystic experience again, looking into the heart of light, speechless, taken by the girl's beauty uh, when the hyacinth girl was with him a year ago. We infer that that relationship is gone now. We come back at this point to Richard Wagner. We had the lover looking across the sea, Tristan looking toward Ireland for his sweetheart Isolde. He's hoping a ship will show up on the horizon, bringing his sweetheart to England. But instead, as the opera goes on, the German reads, Oid und leer das Meer, wide and empty the sea. There is no ship bringing my lover. Memory and desire, forms of cruelty in this month of April. We proceed at this point with the fortune teller episode. <clears throat> Madame Sesostris is the fortune teller, uh, a famous clairvoyant. She had a bad cold, nevertheless. Perhaps she doesn't have supernatural powers. Nonetheless, she is known to be the wisest woman in Europe with a wicked pack of cards. Here, she said, is your card, the drowned Phoenician sailor. Well, this is the section on the burial of the dead. And in section four, death by water, we will encounter that drowned Phoenician soldier. He's called Phlebas the Phoenician. Your card, your future. In truth, if you go to have your future predicted, uh, almost anyone could make the prediction. You're going to die. You will be subject to the burial of the dead, or at least to drowning, as Phlebas the Phoenician was and Jean Verdinal, it was thought. We proceed at this point, after the reference to the drowned Phoenician sailor, with a new myth of rebirth, something from Shakespeare. It is not a Christian myth of rebirth, but it is something that shows up in Shakespeare's play, The Tempest. And in it, the youth who was washed ashore after the ship is wrecked in the storm, thinks his father is dead. Uh, the fairy Ariel sings to him a song of consolation. Yes, full fathom five, thy father lies. He is drowned at the bottom of the sea. Turns out that's not so. But in, at this point in the play, we have that song. And in the song, the myth of rebirth shows up in this line. Those are pearls that were his eyes. That is, your father has been turned into something rich and strange. Those are pearls that were his eyes. Of his bones is coral made. He's been transformed into something beautiful under the sea. A myth of rebirth, as it were, better certainly than the naturalistic uh, prospects in the wasteland can offer. We go on with the fortune telling. Here is Belladonna, the Lady of the Rocks. Well, that formulation, the Lady, usually is a Christian reference. Our Lady of Mercy, uh, Our Lady of some city, perhaps, 
uh, Our Lady of Lords. Uh, when we have this formulation, the Lady of the Rocks, capital L and capital R, well, the rocks in Eliot's work are a generic reference to the wasteland. It is a pile of rock. And that's the best we can do for Our Lady in this naturalistic setting. Here's the man with three staves. That's one of the cards I held up in our last session from the Tarot deck. The merchant, the man with three staves, he's looking out at sea, looking at his ship, a tiny little uh, figure out there of a ship, presumably carrying his merchandise to make a profit. And here is the wheel, another card. Uh, I consider that the single most important symbol in all of Eliot's poetry, because it is the fundamental design of nature, whether it is the way the atom functions with the electron, or the planets going around the sun, or the great galaxies whirling like a giant wheel in the cosmos, or even on our individual level, the circulation of the blood, all of which are subject to another wheel, the wheel of time, meaningless repetition of natural cycles. Here the wheel, here the one-eyed merchant, uh, which would turn into the jack in our modern playing cards. And this card, which is blank, well, if that card comes up, when you want your fortune told, you are in a very bad way. I do not find the hanged man. That's an extremely important missing card from the deck. The hanged man, as I mentioned in our last session, literally would refer to one of these bodies, such as were found in the peat bogs of Denmark, uh, preserved by the peat, a leathery sort of a cadaver with a rope around its neck. A number of those have been discovered from thousands of years ago. And the inference is that these were sacrificial scapegoats killed to provide a benefit for the society, perhaps to extend life for the society, to appease the gods, whatever was necessary. In the Western heritage, of course, Jesus is the hanged man, a man put to death so as to provide life for uh, his believers and followers. I do not find the hanged man. There is no Messiah, no savior in the wasteland. That card is missing. Fear death by water, again anticipating part four of this poem. We then have a quotation from Dante's Inferno. I see crowds of people walking in a ring. Um, T.S. Eliot said that Dante and Shakespeare divide the world. There is no third. I can't say I would agree with that. But for Eliot, uh, this was how much he revered these two writers whom he cites frequently. This quotation from Dante I see crowds of people walking in a ring, is when Dante first peeped over the edge of hell, which is uh, portrayed in the Divine Comedy as a gigantic pit funneling down through the earth and uh, with terraces or circles cut into the edge of the pit and people are being punished on these various ledges for the sins they committed in their mortal lifetime. So we have the wheel image then applied, people going around in that circular motion forever and ever in hell. Uh, we now proceed toward the end of the fortune teller episode. Uh, thank you. If you see dear Miss Equiton, presumably the fortune teller, Madame Sesostris is speaking to her client. Tell her I'll bring the horoscope myself to predict the future in that fashion. We turn now as we end part one of this poem, The Burial of the Dead, we turn back to that original philosophical 
melancholy voice addressing the city of London in much the same way that Baudelaire addressed the city of Paris back around the 1850s. Unreal city, he says, something I think he got from Baudelaire. Under the brown fog of a winter dawn, we remember the fog as a motif of isolation back in Prufroth when he stared at the fog out the window instead of attending to the people at the party. A crowd flowed over London Bridge so many, I had not thought death had undone so many. That's another line from Dante's Inferno. He was astonished at how many people were crowded into these ledges, these circles of hell. And for T.S. Eliot, not believing in the supernatural, the city of London will do very nicely as a hell for our time. Sighs short and frequent were exhaled. Each man fixed his eyes before his feet. This, of course, is the motif of loneliness. People crowded together in the great metropolises of the 20th century, but never have people been more isolated from each other spiritually. Um, we proceed at the end of part one, The Burial of the Dead, with three kinds of naturalistic resurrection. And these three modes of resurrection are presented in the style of Dante's Divine Comedy. In the Divine Comedy, uh, Dante repeatedly meets people in the next world that he knew in this world. And when he meets them, he generally uh, expresses surprise. What are you doing here? Uh, the sinner then will tell his story, why he has been punished in hell. Dante will record it as part of his poem. Now, something like that happens as we end the burial of the dead. There I saw one I knew and stopped him crying, Stetson, you who were with me in the ships at Milai. Milai was an ancient sea battle. Uh, it does suggest in the wasteland World War I and the greatest sea battle of that war, the Battle of Jutland. Uh, when the German Navy and the British Navy collided, they were both very powerful fleets. And after all the destruction, the slaughter, the ships going down, it ended basically in a draw. Both fleets retired to their home base to lick their wounds. So you who were with me in the ships at Milai, that corpse you planted last year in your garden, has it begun to sprout? Will it bloom this year? Well, that's one way to raise the dead. If that corpse underground suffices to feed some flowers, when they bloom, we could say that is the return of the dead in some fashion. It's not very satisfactory, really, but it will have to do. There is no real resurrection of the dead. We proceed to the second kind of re, uh, resurrecting the dead. Has a sudden frost disturbed its bed? That is the bed of that corpse you planted last year. Now in Northern countries, once again, the ground can freeze so hard, so solid, that it can crack. That does happen sometimes. And when the ground cracks, well, something that's buried under the surface might get pushed to the surface. Perhaps that corpse might reappear. That would be resurrection of the dead, naturalistically. We proceed to the last of the, these three kinds of naturalistic resolutions to the problem, the burial of the dead. Keep the dog far hence that's friend to men, or with his nails he'll dig it up again. Well, if the dog were to dig up its master's body, I suppose we could say that's a kind of resurrection. It will have to do. It's all we have. We have no myth of rebirth in the wasteland. Part one ends with a line from Baudelaire, the flowers of evil, fleur du mal. You 
hypocrite lecteur, mon sublime, mon frère. You hypocrite reader, my double, my brother. Baudelaire addressed his reader that way at the outset of his great set of poems, The Flowers of Evil. So we'll end our look at part one, The Burial of the Dead, with that line of Baudelaire. And uh, in our next session, we'll take up part two, A Game of Ch